Hey everybody, Dr. Adam Friedman here from GW. I'm gonna to talk to you about diet and acne. And I, I would argue it'd be hard for a day to go by where one of our patients doesn't ask how diet affects their skin disease. And given acne being the most common inflammatory skin disease, no question, it will come up a lot. It also doesn't help. There's a lot of misinformation or self-imposed experts in this area on social media talking about fad diets or what you can or cannot eat when it comes to acne. Um, so let's just get right into it in terms of what we know and why diet could potentially be a problem when it comes to this very common yet disabling inflammatory skin disease. I have no complex of interest related to this talk. So, you know, to take a step back, um, acne and its incidence has really exploded on an exponential scale. And this concept of being a disease of Western civilization really comes from the fact that there are places around the world where acne just doesn't exist. And these are areas where they don't have fried food. They don't have Reese's peanut butter cups, though so good, true story. Um, you know, and, and they, they really don't have these issues. So, so it, it really kind of hits on, are we really what we eat? And I think the answer is yes. You know, think about things in the Western diet versus the diet in, you know, in Islanders of Papua New Guinea, you know, where they have very low glycemic loads. They really have nothing that is chock full of our daily diet here. They don't have milk products or dairy products chock full of hormones. Their caloric intake is a fraction of what ours is. So, you know, I certainly would argue yet again, you are what you eat. But is it that simple? And, and uh, you know, I think certainly in the discussion with the patient, you can try to make it that simple. And that's what I say, that it's not about one particular food or another. It's that things you know that are inherently bad for you can be bad for any inflammatory skin disease. Uh, and that would include acne. So there's actually been a good amount of work looking into the pathophysiology or pathomechanisms of how diet plays a role in disease pathogenesis. Um, I just wanna highlight Vivian Shi, who actually put together a really nice session at the Academy this year, focusing on how diet influences um, a variety of diseases we take care of. Um, and I, I think that this concept of healing with food or rather taking a preventive strategy with purposeful diet selection certainly should be at top of mind because I think it does play a role in how we manage our, our patients. So let's talk a little bit about the pathophys of acne before diving into diet. So a pimple is not just a pimple. There's a lot going on with acne vulgaris. And historically, they would talk about these kind of four pillars of overgrowth of C acnes here, too much sebum, inflammatory instigation, hyperkeratinization. Which one happens first? Well, it doesn't have to be linear. I don't think it is. In fact, we know that in someone who develops acne, even a normal appearing skin, if you were to cut a piece of that skin and process for H&E and look under the microscope, there will be a peripylosebaceous unit inflammatory infiltrate before you even see skin disease. So I, I think a lot of this is driven by an infl inappropriate inflammatory response. And some of that could be related to dysbiosis, as I mentioned in my um, dysbiosis talk, which you can access on the app. Um, so I, I think it's not as simple as saying these are the four culprits, but rather it's a mishmash. It's not linear. It's probably more uh, like a roller coaster, so to speak, in terms of things going on all at the same time or at individual temporal time points. But the point I want to make is, all acne is inflammatory, even comedones. Inflammation is driving their development. And we have a really good understanding of this. So pattern recognition receptors, some are on the cell surface, like toll-like receptors, some are inside the cell, um, which, are the, which is the inflammasome. Both of these are important in terms of recognizing, in this case, components of C acnes that then leads to the mobilization of interleukin one beta. Um, for anyone taking exams coming up, this certainly is fair game on an exam from a basic science perspective. And so, yeah, it, it is certainly very complicated in terms of how you get to that pimple, in terms of how hormones influence the sebacyte, keratinocytes, inflammatory mediators, you name it. There's a lot going on here. And I think it's really important to highlight hormones, not just because a, a inherited sensitivity to androgens can certainly be associated with acne. Overproduction of androgens in certain clinical environments um, can lead to really robust acne in addition to hirsutism, seborrheic dermatitis, and androgenic alopecia, but we can get hormones from the outside. And that's where diet, once again, can certainly come in. So diet and acne. 
I'm going to take a moment to allow you to kind of get through your seizure looking at this slide and then kind of dive in and try to simplify it. The reason I'm showing this relatively recently published figure is to really highlight how complicated diet can make things for acne patients, whether it be high glycemic load, milk, but also what I like what's shown here is how certain diets can actually be beneficial to mitigating the impact of diet, but also mitigating the inflammatory cascade of acne. So let's try to simplify this a little bit. So I mentioned those kind of four pillars of acne. And let's even take a step back further, what biological processes are driving these? And there is one kind of common funnel down thread, which is the mTOR pathway, which, uh, which plays a very big role in a lot of different diseases. But when we think about diet and we think about hormones, androgens, when we think about you know insulin growth factor, um, which is obviously generated to produce insulin in the setting of diet, all these things can certainly play a role in modulating proliferation, sebum production, hyperkeratinization, um, not to mention that they can uh, influence in, in turn and maybe secondarily the overgrowth of C acnes. So you may have heard of mTOR, not in the inflammatory world, but more in the neoplastic world, as mTOR is a target for, for several medications. Actually, a, um, a topical mTOR inhibitor was just approved for the treatment of angiofibromas um, for tuberous sclerosis. Um, but you can see, once again, as I was mentioning, there are a bunch of different proliferative pathways that filter down into mTOR. And so in the same vein here, diet can influence certain elements that filter down to mTOR causing for overgrowth. And I think this figure really simplifies that, that dairy and high glycemic load in, in one way or another activates the mTOR pathway, which then leads to not only acne, but other corresponding potential issues like increased BMI and insulin resistance. So let's kind of go through some of the usual suspects when it comes to uh, diet and acne. Before doing so, let's define some things. I've already said glycemic index. So glycemic index is how a drug, our drug, how a, how a, a food, or in this case specifically sugar, will increase blood glucose level two hours after consumption of that of that food. So that's how you define the GI. The glycemic load is the food's ability to raise blood glucose levels, and that really rela relates to carbohydrates in food. So GI refers to um, increased rise of blood glucose levels relative to pure glucose two hours after consumption. So you're comparing what does glucose do to blood sugar versus the food two hours later versus just how does a food raise blood sugar? That's the glycemic load. And when we say low glycemic index or low diet, you're talking about low carbs, also reduced meat, bacon, sugar, and refined grains. It is very easy to find lists of, uh, or, or kind of the charts than the top top players of the glycemic index and load. And here is a great example in terms of, uh, you know, top players, glucose being at the very top. When I say top, I mean the bottom of this list, but you can start to go from the bottom to the top and see watermelons pretty high there. White rice, white bread, mac and cheese, my kid's favorite, sadly. So let's just try and keep it simple. High glycemic index foods have a score 70 or higher. And I mentioned some of those already, white rice, bread, pretzels, bagels, um, which I just enjoyed this morning, sadly, um, sugar sweetened beverages. And as I mentioned, watermelon in the middle or bananas. I think people have to realize fruits aren't always healthy, so to speak. Um, raisins are another big one. And then the low ones are going to be oatmeal, peanuts, hummus, uh, skim milk, though obviously it has its own issues. And then majority of fruits, those I mentioned, bananas, grapes, and watermelon are higher on that index. Shocker alert high glycemic index and glycemic loads have been shown in multiple studies to be associated with acne. Who knew? All right, one other thing I wanted to mention is adiponectin and why you should know about this. So this is derived from adipocytes and it's produced in the fat. It has a lot of beneficial properties. It downregulates those pattern recognition receptors, increases insulin sensitivity, it inhibits mTOR. Remember we talked about mTOR being bad and being overly turned on in acne. However, when you have a high BMI, obesity, and you have a high GIGL diet, that will actually reduce adiponectin concentrations. So when you eat well, exercise, behave, so to speak, adiponectin goes up. So um, can you get it back? You know, what can you do to influence? And this was a nice small study looking at severe acne patients versus healthy controls. 
um, and looked at patients who finished isotretinoin six month course, which is a little low in my hands. I usually have a longer course and higher dosing, but what they wanted to see is being isotret is so effective. Is it doing something to certain markers uh, of, of disease like adiponectin? And interestingly enough, um, following isotretinoin, it had a, uh, inc an, an interesting impact in terms of increasing levels to that of someone who doesn't have acne. That's the kind of end all be all of this small study. So very interesting that things we're already doing are influencing factors that are important for mitigating how diet influences inflammation. Dairy, niche good. So dairy increases in um, insulin growth factor one um, and casein in dairy certainly has a big play, play in that. But also don't forget the whey protein. That plays a big role in how dairy influences uh, acne as well. It's insulotropic, it's an mTOR act, uh, activator. Um, so you also have to consider whey supplements because those can certainly influence acne. So ask your patients, you know, especially, you know, maybe if you see someone who looks like they may be a bodybuilder, are they taking whey protein in addition to high dairy intake? You also think about the anabolic steroids and growth factors that are put into dairy products or given to uh, cows to produce more milk. Um, and you know, DHT, and they, there's a nice study, and this is a figure from that study showing that GHT, DHT can increase the production of fibroblast growth factor, which in turn can influence the follicular unit. Um, also very interesting, skim milk, most androgenic, most, most, most acnegenic actually, or comatogenic, which it sounds counterintuitive because you think that you pull the fat out, you pull out the hormones, but it may be because you're also putting out the estrogens, which can be beneficial. Um, also, we know milk can interfere, dairy products interfere with certain antibiotics too. So something to think about. I will say, however, most studies are self-reporting, so they're limited. We have some good hypotheses as to why this happens, but certainly more work is needed. Oh, and what about chocolate? Chocolate, chocolate, always under fire. It's gone back and forth. You know, the original study published in 1969 by Fulton and colleagues showed that acne and chocolate really didn't run in the same crowd, that chocolate did not cause acne. That said, this study was not well controlled and notably, it was funded by the American Association of, of Chocolate Manufacturers. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. Um, so in that study, they showed that excessive intake of chocolate in fact did not alter the composition or output of sebum. However, there've been multiple studies since then showing that yes, even dark chocolate can. Um, AAD, however, it says that chocolate without added sugar or milk is unlikely to cause acting development. So pure cocoa, maybe not. Um, and I think that's kind of the line we're giving. So pure cocoa, no sugar, no milk, no dairy in it doesn't seem to be a problem. It's the things that are added to the chocolate. So end all be all, we have tons of data showing that diet and acne certainly are interplaying one another. And so diet can certainly drive disease. So I think it's something we do have to talk about with our patients and, and counsel and even ask our patients about. So yay for us, we figured this out. What do we do about it now? And that truthfully, we don't have the best answers yet, but we are working on it. Now we know if, if a high glycemic load or index diet makes it worse, you would assume that removing those things that stimulate like dairy and, and high GI, high GL would, would help. And the answer is it does. There actually are multiple studies showing that it helps. In terms of some specific things that are useful like omega fatty acids and some uh, nutritional supporting agents, we'll get into those. There is some data supporting their use too. However, a vegan diet and using probiotics have not been proven to be effective as of yet. So let's start with omega fatty acids. MOA, they decrease uh, insulin growth factor and they can inhibit inflammatory mediators like leukotriene B4. Now their initial evidence, you know, suggest it was more of kind of like a portal of evidence in that if you ate less fish, that increases the area of acne. I find like those types of studies truthfully don't necessarily, uh, you know, convince the jury, uh, but certainly it, it, it is supportive and, and raises an eyebrow to investigate further. However, there's been some nice studies. So this was a 10 week study, 45 individuals uh, who were given different types of, 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 of fatty acids, um, alpha linoleic acid, and even a control group. And in the omega fatty acid and the alpha linoleic acid group, they all did pretty well to be quite honest versus the control. And you can see some images from the study here. So something pretty easy to do um, and implement and add to, to one's routine. Vitamin D has, has, has definitely received some attention as well. Um, vitamin D can inhibit the production of interleukin-17, inhibits that mTOR, pesky mTOR, 
and it can increase the production of antimicrobial peptides against the acnes. The rationale, and similar to that omega fatty acid rationale, is that vitamin D deficiency is seen in up to almost 50% of acne patients. So maybe in the same vein, there's an inverse relationship. So if you supplement, maybe it'll help. I think it's kind of those like not, you know, you know, no brainers. Like everyone needs vitamin D, can't hurt to give a normal supplement based on uh, Institute of Medicine recommendations. So certainly can't hurt. Zinc has a lot of interesting properties. Um, sebaceous glands are actually zinc dependent. Uh, to be honest, they have various enzymes that are zinc dependent. And so there are a bunch of studies looking at oral zinc as an adjuvant or even as a monotherapy for the management of, uh, of, of acne vulgaris. The largest of these studies was pretty large, 150 uh, subjects in each arm. Um, and they compared elemental zinc to minocycline. So a potent and well-established uh, antibiotic. And the minocycline wasn't that much more effective. I mean, I, I listen, not inferior, but great, but to be 17% less effective than minocycline for something as simple as zinc is, is pretty impressive. So some pearls related to it comes in a lot of forms. I typically use the gluconate form, but you can also get it from food. I've listed here various food sources uh, rich in zinc, but very importantly, you want to balance with copper. Zinc alone can result in anemia because it can interfere um, uh, with, um, with certain processes uh, for hemosynthesis. So you wanna balance things out, um, eight to one zinc to copper. And most, many of these supplements out there contain that. Also, it can interfere with absorption of tetracyclines as well. Niacinamide, water-soluble B vitamin, lots of data about its anti-inflammatory activity, easy to formulate because it is, once again, water-soluble, it's light and air stable as well, and it penetrates the stratum corneum. So, so kind of an easy uh, vitamin to play with versus like vitamin C, for example. Great study, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, showing that oral niacinamide 500 twice a day in high risk non-melanoma and melanoma patients, decreasing the incidence of new skin cancers. So clearly a lot even in the dermatological literature. Interesting enough, nicotinic acid can inhibit a, a sebaceous gland activity, can inhibit lipogenesis. Um, this was obviously a, a small study, an in vitro study at that, uh, but certainly supportive of maybe can play a role beyond anti-inflammatory for acne. There have been a couple studies. This was in a supplement in Cutis. Um, that, that showed that this combination of nicotinamide, zinc, and copper, and even folic acid. So it was a mishmash. It wasn't just looking at zinc. Um, there was significant improvement by the end of that study. However, it was all kind of self-reported. I, I don't know. It's a little sus, but certainly supportive that maybe there's something there. We do have one head-to-head -head study of topical nicotinamide uh, versus clindamycin. Um, and depending on whether someone had oilier or less oily skin, one out to the other. But either way, to me, going head-to-head -head against a topical antibiotic where we really need to be mindful about overusing even topical antibiotics, that's certainly supportive that this could be used potentially as an adjuvant. So what are some practical pearls here? So they're simple diet don'ts. Dairy, whey protein supplements, high GIGL diets skim and reduce fat milk and processed food because at the end of the day, all these drive mTOR activation. What are some practical things we can talk to our patients about? And this is actually coming from the AAD. Um, first and foremost, realistic expectations. Changing your diet will not cure your acne, okay? Dietary factors alone are not the driver of disease. However, implementing these various things may help your therapeutic regimen work better for you, but it all takes time. You know, even with our therapeutic regimens, it takes a good 12 weeks to kick in. The same will be true for making any dietary changes. They're not going to see a change the next day. No question, nutritional counseling is good for all health, but if we're thinking specifically acne, there's enough data to support making these simple recommendations, low GIGL, avoid dairy, whey protein, and certainly some things might actually be beneficial like zinc, vitamin D, omega fatty acids as well. Thank you so much for your attention.